on the face of the earth. But not only is the stuff that makes him love all the more, he loves his enemies. He lives for the sake of others. And no cost is too great in order to bring back the family of God. He has committed his life to restoring us to God's true love, God's true life, and true lineage so that we look upon each other as brothers and sisters, one family under God. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Chosen, the weekly program, educational program sponsored by the American Clergy Leadership Conference, 
We're so glad you've joined us this evening. It's going to be a great time. God bless you all on this April 24th, 2023. And tonight it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to some and to uh, just bring forth an amazing woman of God, Apostle Glenda Phillips Lee, founder of International Gospel Helpers Church. She is the ACLC coordinator for the state of Connecticut, and she's very active in women in ministry, and she's got her hands all over the world. <laughs> God bless you uh, for your work in Africa. Would you please open us in prayer, Apostle Glenda? Amen. To God be the glory. Good evening to all of you in your respective places. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving, your courts with praise. We are thankful, oh God, for you, and we bless your holy name. We ask tonight, oh God, for clarity and understanding of your word. We know, oh God, that your word is active, it's alive, oh God, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We ask, oh God, that you help us, oh Father, to fully grasp the depth and the meaning of these teachings, oh God. Your word has the power, oh God, to penetrate even the divided and the souls, the marrows and the joints. It judges, oh God, the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. And we pray, oh God, that you would use your word to guide us, to convict us, oh God, and to transform us. Give us, Father, the wisdom to discern truth from falsehood, what is symbolic and what is literal. Help us, God, to apply your word to our lives and to teach others, oh God, to live by them. As we guide and uh, walk in your word and we meditate on your word, oh God, we ask that you would reveal to us, oh God, the hidden treasures and the insight that lies within. Help us to see your word, oh God, with fresh eyes and to understand it more deeply than we've ever done before. We thank you, oh God, for the gift of this word, the gift of these teachings, oh God, for the power, oh God, that it holds, oh Father, to make us new men and women, oh God, for truly if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. Your word, oh God, has become a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Father, we seek to know you more. Lord God, may we be obedient to these teachings, oh God. And Lord God, may we submit the more to your wisdom and understanding, oh Father. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. Lord, touch the speaker tonight. Anoint him afresh, oh God. Give him even fresh revelations, oh Father, that we may all understand, Father, your will and your way. In Jesus' name, amen and Aju. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. Thank you for reminding us, Apostle, that we really... We're looking for hidden treasures. God has prepared hidden treasures. Jesus has prepared new wine, and I must become a new wineskin. I must become a flexible new wineskin that that fresh wine can be poured into, lest I, if I'm just a crusty old wineskin, and I try to hear new truth, the truth will expand and, and blow my mind. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> I don't know if I can survive that, but <laughs> God bless you all. Last week, uh, our presenter, who's going to be presenting tonight, did an excellent job of looking at the providence of restoration in the family of Adam, the first family. We all know, anybody who studies the Bible, anyone here on this call knows that, unfortunately, there was failure in the first family. A complete debacle. The parents, Adam and Eve, uh, disobeyed God's word. They'd been given a word by God. They'd been given a word of the three blessings to become fruitful, which is to be mature, right? To multiply, which is to be blessed in holy marriage and to have a heavenly dominion over the created world. They were told also to not eat from the, true, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And those things they did and they were cast out of Eden and basically raised a family outside of Eden, outside of the bosom of God. 
where within the first family we studied last week, the eldest son, right in the first family, committed the first act of domestic violence. He took the life of his younger brother. We learned from the, the uh, divine principle that there were, there were two uh, foundations that originally Adam should have done, should have uh, completed in his life, a foundation of faith by having faith in God's word, and that applied to Eve as well, and a foundation of substance by which he and she would grow to become the incarnation of God's word, the substance of God's word. But we know that they failed those things as well. And it was left up to the sons to accomplish those things. We saw the divided situation of the firstborn son, Cain, the secondborn son, uh, Abel. Abel's offering was accepted. That was the foundation of faith. But the foundation of substance, it's tricky stuff. Because we learned last week that <clears throat> there are four things that the archangel did. He left his position. I'm sorry, he failed to see from God's viewpoint. He left his position, he reversed dominion, and he multiplied evil. And in the process of restoration, in the foundation of substance, there's going to be two positions, and one position is going to have to humble itself and see from God's viewpoint, maintain its position, be submissive in obedience to the one that God is working through, and multiply goodness. So I hope I've done a good introduction for today's uh, topic. Our presenter tonight is the pastor of the United Missionary Baptist Church in East, Jordan, East, Orange, East Orange, New Jersey. And uh, he actually affects clergy all over the state of New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania and Delaware. He's our presenter tonight continuing this work of restoration, the providence of restoration in Noah's family. Would you help me in welcoming up Bishop Michael Sykes? Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Also, Dr. Mark Hernandez, I want to thank you for that dissertation that you gave us a little earlier on the restoration of Adam's family. You were doing such a good job. I want to send you a little message in the chat to tell you to keep on going. <laughs> you're doing something great, you know. And so um, thank you uh, for that. And also, I want to thank um, uh, uh, Apostle Linda Phillips Lee for that wonderful prayer, beautiful prayer. Yeah. Uh, and um, Apostle Linda Phillips Lee is my friend. So it's good to have a praying friend that know how to pray. When you get in trouble, you can call your friend up. So Amen. thank you again for that um, wonderful prayer. Today, what we want to do is conclude um, section two of the province of restoration uh, in uh, Noah's family. As you uh, remember last week, uh, we dealt with uh, the province of restoration in Adam's family. Now, there are two basic principles that we look for when we teach on the problem of restoration. There are two principles that has to work in order for God to fulfill um, his mission. One is the foundation of faith. As we learned last week, um, that is vertical. Uh, one's relationship to God. That's very important. We call it the fellowship of faith. And then we have the foundation of substance, which, may, which really means you must be one with your neighbor, with your friend. And whenever you have the fellowship of faith and the fellowship of substance working together, then God can build on that platform and introduce the kingdom of God once you have those two are working together. And so what we want to do now is to look at um, the positive restoration in Noah's family because we found a failure in Adam's family. But let's go through it so that we can be on the same page, okay? So Cain killed Abel. 
thereby preventing the problem of restoration in Adam's family from being accomplished. Nevertheless, God has predestined absolutely the fulfillment of the purpose of creation and his will remains unchangeable. God, upon the foundation of the loyal heart which Abel demonstrated toward heaven, chose Seth in his place. And from among them, um, Seth descendants, God chose Noah's family and commenced a new chapter in the providence of restoration. Okay. It is written that God judged the world with the flood. I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now this shows that Noah time was the last days. And we also remember that scripture in Hebrews chapter six, when it says, and God repented that he ever made man because of the wickedness of man. Now, Noah's family was responsible to fulfill the indemnity condition to restore the foundation of faith and then the indemnity condition, condition to restore the foundation of substance thereby restoring through identity the foundation for the Messiah, which Adam's family had failed to lay. So we found the failure in Adam's family. Now we're trying to establish the foundation of faith and substance in the family of Noah. So let's see how God is working in Noah's family. So in the problems of restoration through Noah's family, Noah was the central figure to restore the foundation of faith. For the following reasons, he was qualified to make the symbolic offering to God. Number one, God called Noah 10 generations or 1600 biblical years after Adam. Noah was the second ancestor of humanity. We can find that in the book of Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 7. Then thirdly, Noah worked for 120 years on a mountain to build the ark in absolute obedience to God's instructions. He was called by God upon the foundation of Abel's loyal and faithful heart. Noah was a descendant of Seth, chosen to replace Abel. Now we learned that, uh, we know us Bible studiers, uh, that Seth was the third son of Adam. Nor was a righteous man in God's sight. But the object for the condition by which Noah was to restore the fellowship of faith was the ark. Before Noah could stand in place of Adam as the second human ancestor, he first had to make an indemnity condition for the restoration of the cosmos lost to Satan due to Adam's fall. Hence, the object for the condition Noah offered should symbolize the new cosmos and the ark was this object. Now, the ark was built with three decks symbolizing the cosmos, which had been created through the three stages of the growing period. The eight members of Noah's family who entered the ark represented the eight members of Adam's family who, having been invaded by Satan, had to be restored through indemnity. As the master of the ark, Noah symbolized God. His family members symbolized humanity, and the animals brought into the ark symbolized the entire natural world. 
After the ark was completed, God judged the world with the flood for 40 days. What was the purpose of the flood? Great question. Why did we have the deluge? We call it the deluge. Uh, God brought about the flood judgment to eliminate sinful humanity and raise up a family who will relate only with him. So we see God somewhat purging and cleansing the world and attempting to take us back uh, to the Garden of Eden. That's very important um, to remember. As explained in part one, the number 10 signifies unity. It was 10 generations after Adam when God called upon Noah to restore through indemnity the will which he could not fulfill through Adam and bringing the dispensation back into unity with his will. Furthermore, since the goal of restoration is to complete the four position foundation, we often know that, especially the 172, we know about that four position foundation. God worked to raise up each of these 10 generations by setting up an indemnity period to restore the number four. In total, the period from Adam to Noah was an indemnity period to restore the number 40. Due to the lustfulness of the people of those days, however, this indemnity period of the number 40 was defiled, corrupted by Satan. The dispensation of Noah's ark was God's new attempt to restore it. I'm going to say that one more time. It was God's new attempt to restore it, to restore it back to the whole world. Therefore, God sent or God set the period of the flood judgment at 40 days as the indemnity period with the intention of restoring the foundation of faith. Now, the number 40 thus became characteristics of the dispensations for the separation of Satan, which are necessary to restoring the foundation of faith. That number 40 is a very providential number. The Bible says that at the end of 40 days of rain, Noah sent forth from the ark a raven and a dove. Let us examine what future providential situation this foreshadowed. As Amos 3 and 7 says, surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. He always talked to the prophet, the preacher, not through the king, not through the president, but God talks to the preacher, talks to the prophet. But the scripture says, how can they hear without the preacher? The work which God performed around the ark at the end of the 40-day flood symbolizes the entire course of history following God's creation of heaven and earth. The raven, which circled about looking for a place to land until the water subsided, signified that Satan would be looking for a condition to which to invade Noah's family. What was foreshadowed? when Noah sent forth the dove three times. 40 days after the flood, the first dove was sent out. It flew about, but then returned to the ark because it found no place to land and Noah took it back inside. That's Genesis chapter eight, verse number nine. The dove, when it was sent out the first time, represented the first Adam. Due to his fall, however, God could not realize the divine ideal on earth through him. God thus had to withdraw his ideal from the earth for a time and postpone its fulfillment to a later date. 
Seven days later, Noah sent forth the dove a second time. However, the dove returned again. This time it carried in its mouth an olive leaf, indicating that there would be a place for it to land next time. The dove, when it was sent out the second time, symbolized Jesus, the second Adam, or Paul says the last Adam. Jesus came to realize God's complete will on earth. However, if the chosen people were to believe in him, Jesus would have to go to the cross, leaving behind the promise of the second advent. After another seven days had passed, Noah sent out the dove for the third time. This time the dove did not return to the ark for the ground was dry. Genesis chapter eight, verse number 12. The dove when it was sent out the third time symbolized Christ at the second advent who is to come as the third Adam. This foreshadowed that when God, when Christ comes again, he will surely be able to realize God's ideal of creation, which will never again be withdrawn from the earth. When the dove did not return, Noah finally disembarked from the ark and walked upon the earth, which had been purged of sin and made new. This foreshadowed that when the ideal of creation is realized on the earth through the work of the third Adam, the new Jerusalem will descend from heaven and the dwelling of God will be with men. On that ground and with the judgment of 40 days, Noah's family could restore through dignity the foundation of faith by fulfilling the dispensation of the ark exactly as God had attended. This dispensation was an object of the condition in restoring the foundation of faith. Noah successfully restored through indemnity the foundation of faith by fulfilling the dispensation of the ark and thereby making a symbolic offering acceptable to God. Upon this foundation, Noah's son Shem and Ham were then to have stood in the position of who? Cain and Abel respectively. Had they then succeeded in the substantial offering by fulfilling the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature, they would have laid the foundation of substance. Very important, because you have the foundation of faith, now you have the foundation of substance, if they would have obeyed. Let's see what happens. Ham, Noah's second son, had to restore the position of Abel in order to become the central figure of the substantial offering. In the case of Noah's family, it was Noah, not Ham, who made the symbolic offering. Therefore, for Ham to stand in the position of Abel as one who succeeded in making the symbolic offering, he had to become inseparably one in heart with Noah. Let us examine how God tested Ham's artistic oneness with Noah. Let's read, uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 26. Reports that when Ham saw Noah lying naked in his tents, he felt ashamed of Noah and watched us and stirred up the same feelings in his brothers, Shem and Japheth. So, swayed by Ham to feel ashamed of their father's nakedness and turning their face so as not to behold the sight, they walked backwards and covered their father's body with a garment. 
this act constituted a sin. So much so that Adam, that Noah, I'm sorry, rebuked Ham, cursing him to be a slave to his brothers. Hmm. Why was it such a sin to feel ashamed of nakedness? That's a good question because in Genesis chapter 2 is 25, it says, and they both were naked and unashamed. So there's nothing wrong with being naked if you're in the right context of God's will. To understand this matter, let us first recall what constitutes sin. Satan cannot manifest his powers, including the power to exist and act unless he first secures an object partner with whom he can make a common bond and engage in a reciprocal relationship of give and take. And we saw that in Adam's family. Hmm. Whenever a person makes a condition for Satan to invade, and he will invade, it means that he has allowed himself to become Satan's object partner, thereby empowering Satan to act. That is, or that does constitute a sin. When you are incorporated with Satan, and you have a relationship with Satan, then God cannot work on that foundation. He cannot work on a foundation if, if it's corrupt. Let us examine why God tested him by having him behold Noah's nakedness. We saw that the ark symbolized the cosmos and that the events occurring immediately after the dispensation of the ark represented the events which took place immediately after the creation of the cosmos. Hence, Noah's position right after the flood was much like that of Adam after the creation of heaven and earth. So Adam and Eve before the flood were close in heart. I'm sorry, let me read that again. Adam and Eve before the fall was close in heart and innocently open with each other and with God. As it is written, they were not ashamed of their nakedness. I just said that to you earlier. Yet after they fell, they felt ashamed of their nakedness. They covered their lower parts with fig leaves and hid among the trees of the garden, fearing that God would see them. Hmm. The shame was an indication of their inner reality, for they had formed a bond of blood ties with Satan by committing sin with their sexual parts. By covering their lower parts and hiding, they expressed their guilty conscience, which made them feel ashamed to come before God their maker, nor who has severed his ties to Satan through the 40-day flood judgment was supposed to secure the position of Adam right after the creation of the universe. God expected Noah's family members to react to Noah's nakedness with no feeling of shame or thought to conceal his body. For by taking delight in the innocence of Noah's family, God could recover the joyful heart which he had felt when looking at Adam and Eve in their innocent stage before the fall. But to fulfill such a profound wish, God had Noah to lie naked, coming back, restoring back to the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve was naked. Now Noah had to be naked in order to fulfill God's providence. Had Ham been one in heart with Noah, 
regarding him with the same heart and from the same standpoint as God, he would have looked upon his father's nakedness without any sense of shame if he was one with his father Noah. Now we see the breakdown of the foundation of substance. We can thus understand that when Noah's sons felt ashamed of their father's nakedness and covered his body, it was tantamount to acknowledging that they, like Adam's family after the fall, had formed a shameful bond of kinship with Satan and were, and were thus unworthy to come before God. Satan, like the raven hovering over the water, attacked the family by taking Noah's son as his object partners when they, in effect, acknowledged that they were of his lineage. When Ham felt ashamed of his father's nakedness and acted to cover it up, he made a condition for Satan to enter. Hence, his feeling and act constituted what? Everybody say, a sin. Consequently, Ham could not restore through indemnity the position of Abel from which to make the substantial offering. Since he could not establish the foundation of substance, the, found, the providence of restoration of Noah's family did what? It ended in what? Everybody, in failure. Failure, yes. Why? Because it's very clear here that they did not establish the foundation of substance with Noah. And therefore, it ended in a failure, and God could not work on that foundation. It's always sinful to regard nakedness with a sense of shame. No, Noah was a special case. In the position of Adam, Noah had the mission to remove all of Adam's conditions, which had left him vulnerable to Satan's attack. By demonstrating that they never felt ashamed of Noah's nakedness, nor would attempt to cover it, Noah family would have fulfilled the indemnity condition to restore the position of Adam's family in its original innocence. Therefore, this was an indemnity condition which only Noah's family was required to fulfill because God was working through the family of Noah. That's right. Ham criticized Noah from a self-centered perspective and showed his displeasure by his action, frustrating God's providence in Noah's family. We too need humility, obedience, and patience to walk the path toward heaven. Next, the providence in Noah's family teaches us about God's conditional predestination of the fulfillment of his will and his respect for human responsibility. Third, it teaches us about God's conditional predestination of human beings. Although God has striven obviously for a long time to find Noah and raise him up as the father of faith. When his family failed its responsibility, God abandoned him and Abraham was now in his place. And so I want to thank all of you all for listening. So to sum it up, we did not find the foundation of, of faith and the foundation of substance in the life course of Noah. And the reason why is because his children failed the providence of or the foundation of substance. And they could not fulfill that 
therefore they fail, it constituted sin, and God cannot operate or work or bless on a foundation of sin. Sin destroys, sin dooms, sin damnation, one's relationship when it comes to God our Father. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Thank you so much, Bishop Sykes. That was really wonderful, really refreshing. Your energy, you're emphasizing certain points, you're going back to them to really, you know, bring out, just as uh, Apostle Glenda Phillips uh, Lee was talking about in her prayer or preaching, that we could really have our open ears and open hearts to see and to receive something from God and, and look at it. And also that we would be encountering hidden treasures, you know, hidden secrets tonight. So what uh, you just presented in the 12 hour exposition of the divine principle on restoration of Noah's family, it's wow, it's eye opening because we traditionally we didn't look at it that way. We've got with us some great clergy with us. We've got uh, Dr. Tanya Edwards from the World Christian Leadership Conference. We've got Dr. Bishop Jesse Edwards, uh, part of our executive committee for the American Clergy Leadership Conference. I see also uh, Reverend Alexander. I see Dr. Madeline Clark Alexander. I see uh, Melvin Quarles. I see several clergy with us uh, with us tonight. I'm just so happy to see you all. I saw, who else did I see just a second ago? Oh, Michael Nkuma. Oh, there you are, Michael Nkuma. Yes, that's right. Good to see you. Yeah. God bless you, Bishop Sachs. It was a nice teaching today. I love every message you said today. Wonderful, wonderful. God bless you, Michael. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. See you in Korea. To you in Korea. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. That's the financial substance. Yeah. To be in Korea. So at this time, I'd like to go to, uh, we've got two people here that present a lot of the divine principle. Uh, that's Dr. Tanya Edwards and Jesse Edwards. And I think I'll go with you first, Bishop. Uh, if you'd like to make some comment about what you just heard uh, and also things that you've dug out from this particular section here on the providence of Noah's family. Bishop Edwards? Please unmute yourself. There we go. There, there, we, we, go. there we go. Now we you can hear we learned. <laughs> I don't think I've ever studied the principle that I didn't walk away with some kind of new understanding, new memory of something I knew already, or I thought that I knew already. And I understand the two sons of, of Noah. They could have made the foundation of faith, the foundation of substance, which yeah. would make the foundation for the Messiah. But because of their, I don't know whether it was a misbehavior, I don't know if it was a lack of understanding, but it uh, brings a scripture to my mind that says, train up a child in the way that you want him to grow. I wonder if they had had understanding from Noah about the shame and uh, an unashamedness of being naked. And when God put Noah in that position, in that naked position, it wasn't a, actually a naked position. He was putting him back in the original idea of innocence, total innocence before God. And I don't think we realize a lot of times God can put us in situations in our lives. And we may understand the circumstances, but it could be a time that God is, I don't want to say challenging us, but educating us, building us, taking us or getting us ready for the next level. If they would have just understood that the position that their father was in was where God had put him, they didn't have to like it. Even they didn't have to understand it if they knew that's where God had placed him. And when they were ashamed, they were ashamed of God's position, God's oneness to get back to the innocence of the garden. And so they lost the foundation of faith and substance. So I think that would tell us today, let's watch when God puts something in our lives or a circumstance in our lives. Don't judge the circumstance how you feel or what may come out in your life, but what is God expecting for us to do at that point of time? Because my wife and I could go on and on of things in our life that we didn't like, didn't understand, but we knew what God wanted. And by trusting in God, believing in God, and then being faithful to God, it always came out in victorious ending. If not, of course, then it was suffering and shame. So, you know, I never thought of that particular idea with Noah till just now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sykes. 
presented that very well tonight. And you take me to a whole new level of uh, the two sons of Noah, ham. I always think of ham because I like a ham sandwich. So you name food, I know the son, but the, the others, you know, Japheth and so forth, uh, they don't remind me of anything edible. So I don't remember them so well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bishop. Tanya? <laughs> Thank you for that little touch of humor. I'm going to go to you now, Dr. Edwards, uh, and hear from uh, uh, a woman of God's perspective on this section here that we've just uh, uh, been presented so well by Dr. Sykes. Dr. Edwards? Unmute. Oh, please unmute, Doctor. Sorry about that. No thank problem. you, Reverend Hernandez, and thank you, Reverend Sykes. Yes. What a wonderful, um, uh, you know, reading of the divine principle and for chosen, because like um, Bishop Edwards said, every time we read it, and we've been through the divine principle more than I could count, uh, and the EDP, but every time you learn something di different and new, if your eyes are and your ears are open yes. to receive right. it. And I think that's one of the problems that, that Ham and, uh, you know, his brothers went through, because at the time, they probably should have stopped and prayed, or at least asked God, what should I do? Yes. And maybe God would have directed them. But that's the problem that was back then and today. We think of ourselves. We yep. don't we don't think of, okay, God, what would you like? Mm -hmm. Even in an instant, we have to rely on God. Even in an instant of any time of the day, we have to reach out to God. When there's yes. a time and a need, we can't just stand there and do what we think is best. Because so many times I thought, oh, I should do this or this. And I've even picked up the phone to call somebody about a certain situation. And God said, no. Mm -hmm. You know, and before I picked up the phone, I was like, God, what am I going to do? And what should I do? What should I say? And as I was picking up my cell phone, God said, no, stop. Do not call them. Let it go. Let it, you know. And so I think that we deal today in a lot of that, that Satan tries to deter mm -hmm. God's blessings and what, what the spirit of God is saying to us to do and we do things on our own. Mm -hmm. We even call ourselves a certain type of ministry when maybe God hasn't even called us there. Mm -hmm. We may put ourselves in a place where maybe God didn't want us to be. But I think that this relates to me more personally, uh, knowing that we can go off track so quick, so yeah. fast, mm -hmm. and and mess up the whole world, mess up the whole family, mess up the whole atmosphere mess up the whole household we can do things that god is not approved that we go beyond and think of ourselves think of our own feelings oh my gosh they're going to see that my father is naked i've got to cut and thinking of himself yeah and so we've got to be very careful that we don't allow our inner flesh our inner feelings take over that's why we need the holy spirit to direct yeah and lead us and, and guide us and do all truth and all ways and keep us humble. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us, Dr. Edwards, about that point, that why we study the divine principle is to draw out lessons for today. We're not here just to look back at, at Ham and Shem and say, oh, those poor guys, look at how you know misdirected they were. Look at all the mistakes they were. We have to face those same things ourselves. Mm -hmm. so there's so many times in even one day that we need to take the time to stop right. and confer with God. That's to, to number one, to seek God's standpoint, to God's viewpoint. Right. Is this what you want me to do, Heavenly Parent? And not leave our position that God has placed us in, right? Because each one of us is in a dynamic where maybe to someone, an elder spiritually, we're their, we're their Cain, they're the Abel, mm -hmm. right? And we're somebody's Abel, right? That we, yeah. that we guide and we lead. So we're always in those two positions and, and we have to really pray so that we don't misstep, right. step out of our position. And as you were saying, you know, uh, Dr. Sy Bishop Sykes, the, what had Noah done? Noah had just saved their whole family through his yes. faithfulness. Mm -hmm. 120 years of yes. building the ark 
in absolute faithfulness to God. So as you said, the principle says that Noah represented God in that ark and his family represented humanity. Yes. Right? So his sons should have been so grateful to their father. Right? And as you said, Bishop Edwards, that it was all innocence. Yeah. You know, Ham's not walking out in public. He's in his tent. Right. He's just consumed the first fruits of the season, their first harvest after the flood. Right? And he's drunk a little bit too much. Right? And he's just knocked out. You know, his sons could have just gone, oh, dad, oh, dad, you work so hard. God bless you. You know, and that's it. But no, Ham thought from his own point of view. Good point, Dr. Edwards. Robert Hernandez. Yes. I saw something here tonight I'd never thought of before while Dr. Sykes was speaking. He was talking about Lucifer, that if Lucifer did not have a foundation, someone to substantially commit what he was thinking, then Satan was not successful. Wow, that takes me to the scripture that says, resist the devil and he'll flee. If he has no foundation of substance and no foundation of of faith, he cannot even fulfill his. I never saw that before. That's a beautiful, beautiful ministry. Thank you, Dr. Sykes. That's great. That's right. That's in the same way that last week. Yes. God is God is admonishing Cain and telling him, you can you can beat this thing. Yes. You can win this thing. Mm. You can overcome it wow. and make him flee. Right? And That's make right. him flee. Yeah. I want to go to uh, uh, Pastor Nkrumah. You're a kind of a, a novice in the in the world of the study of the principle. And I know that you uh, have uh, studied the 12 hours EDP. Um at the uh, encouragement of Bishop Sykes. And so I wanted to, to um, get your, your take on tonight's presentation, something that you drew from it, uh, maybe something that came out tonight that in your study before, maybe it didn't hit, it didn't, the light bulb didn't go off or whatever. Or maybe you've always had all these light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. First of all, good evening, everybody. Good evening. It was a nice um, teaching today from Reverend Dr. Sykes, it was so great. He's my teacher, my mentor, and my spiritual father. So I always look on to him all the time. So when I saw um, the, the profile that he was going to teach today, I was very, very happy. And I was ready to get out from work so that I can get on the Zoom quickly. So the teachings today, it was so powerful. He touched many bases of what uh, the Bible is always teaching us. The so divine principle is all about the holy principle of God. We have many principles that is in this world. Every institution, every organization, every church, or any other uh, institution that in this world have their own principle. So when you talk about divine principle, it means the holy principles of God. And the holy principles of God is what God used to create the universe as we see today. God is a principal God, and we cannot go beyond his principle. We have to go, we have to follow his principle. So when you follow, you follow God's principle, Amen. everything that you're doing always comes true. But when you go against or you go beyond or you go astray of God's principle, that is where you face consequences right. in your life. Amen. So everything you do, it has principle that goes with it. So divine principle is what connected to the backbone of God himself. He created heaven and earth. He used principle. Everything he created in this world is principle. When he created first mankind, Adam and Eve, he used principle and he gave them his command. He gave them the duty that's supposed to do. That don't do that. You have a dominion. You have this. You have that. So don't touch the fruit. That, uh, of, of, of life and death. That is where we fall when we go against the principle of God. That is where we fall. So now the divine principle now is teaching us how can we pick up back our mistakes? How can we go back to our maker, to our father, that to fellowship with him with the first love that he has for us, the first family that he wanted to establish in this world, so that the whole creations, the animals, the trees, the sea, everything that he created, he will see that we are his first family. 
That is why he laid down the principles for us. So the, the story of the flood and, and Noah and his children, it was kind of restoring back the family that he was looking for from Adam. That's right. He was trying to restore it. So the three children of Noah, they're supposed to be the three trinities establishing the family of God on earth. But unfortunately, some of them did what they didn't supposed to do, looking on their father's nakedness. And when you look at the Old Testament, it's the same nakedness that was revealed that Adam and Eve fell. God came and asked Adam, where are you? He said, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? He said, because I am naked. That's right. That's right. He didn't say because I eat a fruit. He didn't say because of anything. He said, because I am naked. And the same incident happened in Noah and his children because of nakedness. Right. That's right. And Jesus so Christ came. There's no, Jesus there's no Christ mistake. also there's came. No, it's not coincidence. Yes. It's not coincidence. Right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. So Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came and made something example for us that he picked up from the Old Testament and he said, people said you commit adultery when you have intercourse with somebody. That is what the Old Testament said. But he said, the only thing you know that you commit adultery even though when you look in your, the person with your eyes and have a mindset of lust in your mind, you have already committed already. Yeah. So Jesus take you to the next level that it can help us so that we cannot think bad in our mind because everything started with the mind. That's when, right. when you think bad in the mind and then the heart follows and then the body takes action toward it. So Jesus take us in the highest level so that we can totally abstain from such sin. Amen. And then we can have the holiness of God upon our life. Amen. So Jesus Christ give us those things Amen. and then helping us so that we can get connected and close to God as God wants us close to him. That is what I learned today from Amen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Pastor uh, Nkrumah. That was really wonderful. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Amen. I, I want to as we come to our, our closing tonight, we've already uh, come almost to our time period. Um, and we like to be faithful to that so that you, you can depend on us starting at a certain time and concluding at a certain time. But it's an interesting thing, you know, this, how a mistake in one family can have such ramifications. It's because this family, right, comes 1,600 years after Adam's family. It's going to be a whole new beginning again. And just like the first family, the Adam's curse is something we carry to today because that curse passed on to Adam, I mean, passed on to Noah and has passed down to us, right? And as you were saying, Pastor Nkrumah, because of our Lord Jesus, we have the opportunity to reverse that and, and cut off from the curse, and especially through the marriage blessing. But think about it. The... the Adam's partner, we know her name, but we do not know the name of the partner of Noah. Uh -huh. we, we, father, do. we do. It was, we do. It, she was called Mrs. Noah. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> like Noah's the last name. Yeah, Noah's the last name. Mrs. Noah. But Father Moon, Father Moon actually in his lifetime, he asked us to consider that. He said, why is her name not there? Why is her name not there? What he received spiritually from Jesus was that she, I mean, it's a, imagine being the wife of a person who every day goes up that mountain for 120 years to build an ark, right? And his whole focus is that somehow he has three kids, you know, <laughs> he goes up there all the time. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle, right? But she bore resentment. Yeah. She bore resentment to him. And that resentment carry over into her sons. It, it yes. uh, you know, because how could the father save them? And yet the first thing that Ham feels is shame. shame. He's looking down on his father, even though his father has saved him and his, his brothers and their wives. So, wow. So rich, rich night tonight. Thank you so much.
uh, Bishop Sykes. You're a great presenter. Yeah. Presenter. And before we go to our closing prayer, uh, which I'm going to ask uh, Dr. I, I, I had told you Marilyn Coulter, like I was going to ask you, but I'd like to ask Madeline Clark uh, Alexander or her husband to close us out in prayer tonight. They're both here with us. Uh, but I wanted to remind people that next Monday is May 1st. Uh, for our entire National Executive Committee will be in Korea or on the way to Korea. And the next week, May 8th, we'll be returning. So we will, we will not join together again for another uh, chosen until Monday, May 15th. Monday, May 15th. So um, please, next Monday, May 1st, is actually the founding day, the uh, 69th birthday of the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. It was founded on May 1st, 1954. And uh, you can see from the name, it was the Reverend Moon acknowledged that only the power of the Holy Spirit could really bring the body of Christ together. You know, that beautiful mother's heart of Christianity uh, that could bring the unity in the body of Christ. And that's why he founded the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. He did not want to do that. He wanted to really just stir up Christianity and revive Christianity, but he was rejected and ultimately established this so that it could be a, an instrument of restoration, something we've just learned about tonight through Bishop Sykes. So Dr. Madeline Clark Alexander, I'd like to invite you to close us out in prayer tonight. Thank you. Dr. Hernandez, Dr. if I can interject, we have yes. Dr. Rouse on the call tonight. We kind of want to acknowledge him as oh, absolutely. our national co-chairman. Well, let's yeah. pray for him. His, uh, yeah, he, how are you feeling, Dr. Rouse? Are you just listening in or? I am listening in. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Sykes. You look so well there. Doesn't he? you, you Dr. Sykes lost how many pounds, Dr. Sykes? Whoa, how say over 50? <laughs> over, over 50 pounds. And you, and you look 50 years younger. Yes. You That's know? why. Oh, my heavens. Yeah. I'm so. <laughs> I kept thinking, he does look slimmer. He does look slimmer. But I, I said to him early when we were on the backside of the program, wow, you look younger and younger, Dr. Sykes. Pastor Bishop Sykes, you're just amazing. Uh -huh. Yes. But thank see. you. Thank you for a great night. Thank you for great comments. Thank Everything you. is on point. And in this providential ordering of time, we continue to carry out God's story. All of you pray as we go to Korea. It's a very, 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 very significant occurrence next week. And, you know, people have been writing, people have been saying something is going to happen soon. Something is going to happen soon. And those people have no clue about what is going to take place next week. But it's happening next week. Amen. And I hope that all of us who have been following Jesus Christ through what true parents have brought understand the very essence of what next week is all about. This is the final temple in the providential ordering of things that God would have in this providential story. And we are part of it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you again, Dr. Sykes. Thank you. Amen. And thank you, Dr. Rouse, for your comments about the position of women in the Bible and uh, how they're often not named um, mm. unless they're really providential figures. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Clark. Amen. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Bishop Sykes, for that great deliverance with such clarity. Thank you, uh, Reverend Hernandez, for this opportunity to close out in prayer. So greetings, everyone, and may God continuously bless you. Most gracious and heavenly Father, 
We thank you, dear Lord, Father God, that the message was delivered with such clarity, dear Lord, Father God. We thank you for knowledge and revelation that was received on this evening. Dear Lord, Father God, as we continue to go forth, dear Lord, Father God, I pray for everyone that's on this call that you would touch them and anoint them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Dear Lord, Father God, as you have called us as a beacon of light that's set up on the hill, as we walk through our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities, and our states, dear Lord, Father God, please continue to use us as your vessels, dear Lord. And as we are gaining knowledge, dear Lord, Father God, as we are being elevated in your word, give us the boldness to deliver, to regurgitate what we have received and let us not be hearers of the word only, but doers also. Dear Lord, Father God, I pray for the leaders, dear Lord, Father God, for you have blessed them with such superior knowledge, dear Lord, Father God, and faith in you and your word. We thank you, dear Lord, Father God, for Mother and Father Moon, as they have laid this foundation for us to stand on, for us to be delivered through, for us to get of clarity and understanding of Jesus, who he was and what he did. Thank you, dear Lord, Father God, that as Jesus stretched was stretched up on the cross for us, God, you gave your only begotten son. And we thank you that he didn't cry out and say, let me down from here, but he took our sins. So we thank you, Father, as we come to you with a repentant heart. And as we move forward, that you will continue to lead guide and that we will be blessed to be a blessing in this hurting world. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for all things. We give you all honor, glory, and praise for what you're doing in our lives, dear Lord, Father God, and what you're doing in the lives of others. As we we travel to Korea, let us receive all that God has anointed and appointed and approved for us when we get there. And Lord God, let us not keep it to ourselves, but let us continue. Let's spread it throughout the world. Father, I thank you for this meeting on tonight for this teaching on tonight dear lord father god and i pray that we will all regurgitate it and spread it throughout the world in amen. jesus name amen and i jail amen amen, amen. and i god bless god bless god bless wonderful wonderful wow thank you everyone for joining us tonight again the reminder that next monday and the monday after that uh we'll suspend chosen we'll be back here on Monday, May 15th, Monday, May 15th, mark it on your calendars, because we're not going to be the same. We're going Amen. to the mountaintop. Yes. We're going to the mountaintop. Amen. And God bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you so much. God bless you, Amen. Thank you. God bless you, Dr. Rouse. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank 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 you. Good a minute. Bye, Jesse. Wow. <laughs> Bye, Jesse. Bye, Jesse. <laughs> sorry, God bless you. God bless you. Uh, okay, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night Apostle good Glenda. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Love good you. Good night. Bless you. Good love night. you, folks. Scale, God bless. Good night. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Here, bless be good. You. Thank you, Young Soon. God bless you for admitting the call. We thank you so much. Yes. Good job. Good job. Yeah, we couldn't do it without you. you. Yeah, we couldn't do it without her. My heaven. Mr. Davis, hi. Right. God bless everyone. What God a wonderful bless. program tonight. Thank you. God bless. Good night. Bye. What is notice? Who wants to be the last person? 